Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank the Programme Committee of the Deutsche Ophthalmologische Gesellschaft for this very kind invitation to speak on a subject that's very close to my heart. And I would like to thank especially Professor Hagen Thieme for inviting me this year. I have a number of financial disclosures. The only one that's really relevant, I think, to this talk is the uh, uh, patent with the National University of Singapore, as I was a co-designer of the pole glaucoma implant. And I'd like to first take you back a few years to Duane's clinical ophthalmology. Uh, this is volume six, chapter 15, Glaucoma Surgery by George Spath and colleagues. Um, they state that glaucoma surgery is rarely restorative or curative. It usually substitutes one problem for another. The intent is for the new problem to be of lesser significance than the old. The possible exception being iridectomy, uh, glaucoma surgery leaving the patient otherwise damaged. Nonetheless, to advise surgery and to choose surgery is often the wise uh, decision for the patient. Not very encouraging words, really. And this was written in 2001, not 1950. Sorry, George, no offense. Clearly there was room for improvement. Have things improved since 2001? Well, we certainly have a lot more options than we did in 2001. We have uh, broad groups of MIGs uh, on other new surgical procedures, Schlem's canal procedures, subconjunctival drainage. Uh, we have dabbled in the suprachoroidal space. There isn't a commercial uh, device at the moment, but there probably will be. And we have new types of ciliary body ablation. So there's a lot going on. But what drives innovation? What drives all this new excitement? Well, there's a huge amount of commercial innovation. The drivers are perceived market size, unmet clinical need, ease of use, surgeon training, safety, or efficacy. It's interesting that perceived market size is probably what seems from my perspective to drive industry most in other words, will it make economic sense to, to, to devise a new device? From surgeons' perspective, it's often, is it easy to use? Is, can you be trained easily? Is it safe? It often feels as if actual raw efficacy is bottom of the table. And this, this always saddens me because I deal with the patients with the most severe glaucoma. And why does efficacy always seem to be the lowest consideration? There's a widespread belief that all glaucoma surgery is a finite life, lifespan. This is not something I actually mm -hmm. subscribe to. But I fear that it encourages developments of lo development of lots of procedures with lower efficacy that are safer, and you can do one after the other, after the other, after the other. This, of course, is not really what patients would want. They want something that works. Is it just that there's such a small market for procedures with high efficacy that it's not ever economically um, feasible to devise new very efficacious devices or is it just that the higher efficacious devices are just not as cool as MIGs? Yet despite all this innovation and all these new devices, trabeculectomy refuses to die. This is the old Cairns trabeculectomy, it's changed a bit since then. What does it say about glaucoma surgical innovation if we have many new procedures but the most effective one is 53 years old? Well, we can look to cataract surgery. This is my Brexit FACO, um, and this is one type of new cataract surgery, but it exemplifies how much cataract surgery has changed in comparison with, say, trabeculectomy. The bulk of ophthalmic surgical training is cataract surgery. The bulk of surgery in many glaucoma clinical practices is also cataract surgery. Trabeculectomy and tube surgery are performed in lower volume, and to be quite honest, they're best uh, suited to practices geared up for this intensity of work and best done in practices who do a lot. Admittedly, the modern trabeculectomy isn't anything like the Cairns trabeculectomy, and it is more predictable, but one would agree that it still does not have the elegance and slickness of many of the newer minimally invasive procedures. However, obviously, coolness and efficacy don't seem to be the only important factors. Real glaucoma surgery is a big predictability image problem. And it's not that the efficacy is not good, it's the predictability isn't good. And one can argue that with the modern procedures, predictability is much better. And it, I think it certainly is. And here, these are just some of them, obviously.
So how does innovation fit with clinical need? What if surgical innovation was driven only by clinical necessity, by what patients actually need? Well, arguably there are three groups of clinical glaucoma need. Uh, those progressing with central fetal loss or advanced fetal loss, those with less advanced disease who need cataract surgery, and those with complica complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery in very high pressures. The first group need a high efficacy procedure. The second group, not so much. Modest efficacy would be sufficient. The third group really need a high efficacy procedure that works across the board in many difficult situations. The traditional approach, uh, as we all know, was to do a trabeculectomy in the first group, trabeculectomy and cataract surgery in the second group, and trabeculectomy in the third group. In the first group, it tended to work quite well. Maybe a little unpredictable, but it worked well. Second group, overkill. Uh, this is inelegant and it, by today's standards, uh, not really desirable. The third group, it didn't really work, but we did it anyway because there was nothing else we could do. Those progressing with severe glaucoma or central visual field loss do need aggressive IOP control. And the AGES study, the, those who didn't progress in eight years, had mean pressures of 12. And at 12, you had roughly a 13% progression rate at eight years still. So the lower, the better. And it's a fallacy to believe that a pressure of 17 or 18 is satisfactory. It's not. Those are the bottom group with complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery and very high pressures, such as failed trabeculectomies. This patient on the, uh, on the right already had three trabeculectomies. What about this patient with secondary glaucoma and rheumatoid arthritis and severe uh, scleromalacia? It's not that uncommon in my practice. Well, these can be fixed with tubes using underlay patches and a sandwich technique. This is a pericardium with a bar valve implant. Uh, this is another layer of pericardium, or you can use fascia lata, donor sclera, cornea on top. And two and a half years down the line, the pressure is nine millimeters mercury and cosopt, and the vision's unchanged. Uh, th these very difficult cases can be fixed with a bar valve implant. But bar valve shunt surgery although effective in most complex situations, is crude 25-year-old technology performed in high volume by only a relatively small number of surgeons. And for that reason, it isn't accessible for many of the patients who need it. There are really, therefore, three broad groups of clinical problems. It's not simply that one size fits all, and different solutions are really required for each of these clinical scenarios those with central fetal loss or advanced fetal loss, those with less advanced disease who need cataract surgery, and the complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery with very high pressures. Those who are progressing with central visual fetal loss arguably are still best suited for trabeculectomy, or for those in those practices that don't have access to trabeculectomy, subconjunctival MIGs. Canal procedures are really in their uh, element in patients with less advanced disease who need cataract surgery, and this is the only indication for which they're licensed in the US. Those with complex secondary glaucomas or failed uh, surgery and very high pressures really need something better than 25-year-old uh, technology, i.e. the AMID valve or the bar valve implant. Subconjunctival MIGs do lower the pressure more than Schlem's canal procedures, yet it seems they're not quite as effective as trabeculectomy and therefore not best for the very advanced glaucomas, but still better than, than doing something that's less effective. And these obviously are the Zen implant and the pressure flow microshunt. We only have one randomized clinical trial, uh, the one year data of the pressure flow versus uh, trabeculectomy study, which does still show that the trabeculectomy wins in terms of raw pressure control at one year, e even though both cause quite a dramatic reduction in both pressure and medication burden. So I'm not saying that the pressure flow is ineffective. Trabeculectomy still produces lower pressure. The pressure flow is actually very effective as well at one year. 
you can see the difference seems to start at around three to four months because the, the success rate is similar after that uh, out to one year. So if you move on to the second group, which is those with less advanced disease who need cataract surgery, this is really where the canal procedures and internal MIGs come into their uh, own. And this is specifically what they're licensed for in the United States. There are obviously many canal procedures. This is quite a crowded space. And arguably they all do roughly the same thing in a slightly different way, and the, which groups into stenting and cutting. The stenting procedures are generally elegant, minimally invasive, and because they have had to have FDA approval for the device, they have RCT efficacy data, so we know roughly what they do. The cutting procedures, um, because you actually have to physically cut more of Schlem's canal, do create more bleeding or a bit more invasive and lack efficacy data, but they do seem to produce an earlier, higher IOP drop. We don't have comparative data, other we only have a large case series to get a feel for what they all do in the long term. But generally you would expect there'd be a ceiling in terms of Schlem's canal and that these would have similar efficacy. ABIC is a dilating procedure, and again, it is, it is similar. So this is a very crowded space, but they, these are all roughly procedures that would be good in combination with cataract surgery. And the reference publication for the entire group really is the Horizon study that, that shows that at one year, about 70% of FACO patients get a 20% pressure drop, and at two years, um, roughly 57% of patient, FACO patients get a 20% pressure drop, but that this is leveraged um, by the hydrus microstent to 86% at one year and 77% at two years. That gives you a rough feel of what you get from a canal procedure in addition to FACO. Um, so it's, it's a modest pressure drop, but it does leverage the effect of FACO and give higher pressure lowering. Now these with complex secondary glaucomas or failed surgery and very high pressures are really uh, my practice for want of a better description. And we published a prospective study of endothelial cell loss after the Barvalt implant uh, in ophthalmology glaucoma um, after presenting this at American Glaucoma Society last year. Five years, um, you lose about 50% of peripheral corneal endothelial cell density after Barveld implant, and uh, about 36% of central endothelial cell density. So this is fairly dramatic. It's interesting that uh, in the long term, we have very few endothelial cell decompensations because we keep the tube away, well away from the, the cornea, but still there's quite a massive endothelial cell loss. But this was highly tube position specific. If the tube was behind Schwab's line completely, the, the rate of endothelial cell loss was halved in comparison to tubes that were straddling Schwalbe's line. And the common tube implant position is straddling Schwalbe's line. If you don't emphasize to trainees that it must go behind Schwalbe's line, people will tend to put it straddling Schwalbe's line. These tubes are the entire diameter or width of the angle. So if they're not touching the iris, they will be touching the cornea. And tubes touching the iris, contrary to popular belief, do not cause uveitis or problems, and it's better than touching the cornea. The Barveld implant is the most effective IOP lowering Im implant available, but it is very large. The huge Barveld contrasts dramatically with MIGS trend to much smaller subconjunctival devices like the Zen and the Preserflow. And we're now very familiar with these. But the Barvelt plate is large for good reason. This is the reason for the high long-term efficacy. But at 640 microns in diameter, like the Amid valve, the tube is much larger than required. It was simply the size that was economically viable at the time it was made. And the Barvelt Amid tubes occupy the entire drainage angle and must rest on iris to avoid the cornea. And even in some angles, they're still touching the cornea, even when they're lying flat on the iris. And we knew, know that tube contact with corneal endothelium at the entry site kills endothelial cells. 
And a large tube in the scleral surface always carries a small risk of conjunctival erosion. The erosion risk is reduced but not eliminated by a donor tissue patch or a long scleral tunnel. But it's still a risk. Minimally invasive subconjunctival tubes such as Zen are much smaller. And the pressure flow. Now, these mixed tubes are not for complex cases, but they can produce a large pressure drop. So the small tube does not the limiting factor. On gonioscopy, the size difference between the bar valve and the Zen is dramatic. In this case, you can see that the bar valve is bigger than the two Zens. Even a slightly larger pressure flow can fit inside the bar valve, although it's a very tight squeeze. These smaller tubes carry a much lower risk of endothelial cell damage simply because they're much smaller. However, the bigger tubes are also getting smaller. The pole glaucoma implant left, which I do have a financial interest in, has a smaller tube than conventional implants, but a similar plate characteristics and seems to cause uh, similar efficacy. The tube portion is not very much larger than a pressure flow. Compare the tubes and luminal diameters that bar valve pole and pressure flow. The pole is at the bottom. Perhaps inspired by MIGS, even the conventional tubes are becoming less invasive while maintaining efficacy and possibly reducing the risk of exposure and endothelial cell loss. The tube lumen of the pole glaucoma implant at 127 microns is smaller than an amid valve or a bar valve, as you can see here. It can therefore be occluded with 6-0 proline rather than 3-0, which is required for a bar valve. The tube is typically stented all the way into the anterior chamber. In this case, this provides enough resistance to prevent early hypotony. The proline stent is seen here in the anterior chamber on gonioscopy. The pole is implanted under adjacent recti like a bar valve, though it does not extend as far under the muscles. The plate, like a bar valve, is best placed more than 10 millimeters from the limbus. and tightly secured to sclera using 9-0 proline sutures diagonally opposed to prevent any lateral or forward movement. The tubes trimmed bevel up so it will extend one to two millimeters into the anterior chamber. You can see the side-by-side -side comparison of a 30 gauge needle shows just how small the tube is. The anterior chamber is entered with a 25 gauge needle stab just anterior and parallel to the iris plane. Ideally, the eye should be as close as possible to the primary position so the tube does not point towards cornea in the anterior chamber. The tube is then gently fed into the anterior chamber. The back of the plate is examined for aqueous drainage. In contrast to ligation of the tube, which risks a high early pressure, stenting permits better regulation of aqueous flow through the tube. And you can see the drainage uh, coming out the back. 
A dry sponge is inserted into the small well at the back of the plate and then slow aqueous filling in the well should be observed. If the well can't be seen to be filling slowly, the IOP is likely to be too high in the early postoperative period. Overall, this simple flow control technique minimizes the risk of postoperative extremes after the pole glaucoma implant and makes life easier. Really, the patients who have the greatest needs for new surgical approaches are the least well served by them. Interventional glaucoma really needs to be more than minimally invasive procedures in patients with mild glaucoma. If you can't offer a full range of glaucoma surgery, your patients are missing out. So I really would exhort people uh, to, to, to look at innovation in serious glaucoma. Patients need something better than trabeculectomy for a very advanced disease, but are not well served at the minute. And trabeculectomy is still the most effective procedure. And likewise, tubes need to evolve. Thank you very much for your attention and for the very kind invitation.